Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And I'm really excited for today's guest. This is his second time on the podcast. But before we talk to our guest, who's actually going to make us cash flow and wealthier, I'd be remiss if I didn't properly introduce my co-host. You know him. You love him. Scott Todd. ScottTodd.net. Landmodo.com. If you're not automating your Craigslist and your Facebook postings, postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. Learn anything about anything, investor ninjas.com. Scott Todd, are you feeling, uh, feeling the love here? I do feel the love. I do, yeah. Okay, good. Good. You ready for a guest? I'm ready to go. You sure? I am. All right, because if, you, if you're looking at my screen, I've got the water rippling in the background of the beach, right. um, which leads us to our guest, Chris Miles from moneyripples.com. So Chris, this is your, your second time on the podcast, but if you can just quickly go through um, your, your bio, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like you said, you know, it's uh I'm basically the anti-financial advisor, right? Um, so all the stuff you've heard people say about save everything, spend nothing, save forever in mutual funds and all that kind of stuff, I'm completely against that because 18 years ago, I started out being that mainstream financial advisor. And after about four years, realized, look at the real numbers, the evidence, it never works. It's never played out to where people become truly financially free. So 2006, I quit. Vowed never to go back to teach people about money again. I would just teach ballroom dancing and stay that, that route and uh, do mortgages as a loan officer and that kind of thing. And, uh, and, and during that process, I started to meet guys that were millionaires, guys just like you guys, you know, like guys that were making great money in real estate and in business and things like that, who also scoffed at mainstream financial advice, right? They just, they thought Dave Ramsey was an idiot. They thought Susie Orman and all that traditional stuff were just dumb, right? They never worked. And, uh, and so I started to learn what they did and I was actually able to retire the first time in 2006 when I was 28 years old, you know, and, uh, and that was just a shock that I could even do it, you know, like, uh, kind of like what you guys did. Like I found ways to create leverage and, and do it very, you know, kind of actively, but not with using up a lot of my time. Right, so, uh, right. and I was like, what am I going to do when I grow up? And so 2007, I came out of retirement, start teaching people how to do stuff, uh, brief, Reader's Digest version. I went through the recession, went from millionaire to upside down millionaire, and then battled my way back out, clawed my way back out uh, with no money and no credit, but I was able to dig back out of that hole, pay off debts and everything else, and was able to uh, be financially independent once again, December of 2016. And uh, just to prove that, hey, it wasn't just a fluke the first time, I can do it twice, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I love it. I love that story. So, Chris, let's just get into it. We're going to skip the pleasantries, okay? Because on the website, it says that you help fix money leaks and free up an average of $33,000 in their first year of helping entrepreneurs. How in the heck do you help families, entrepreneurs, even Scott Todd, who, you know, is super financially savvy, free up 33 grand in the first year? <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's actually over 34,000 now, but I like to stay conservative so nobody like calls BS. <laughs> okay. You know, um, I'll tell you, and I teach a lot of that stuff on my podcast, The Chris Miles Money Show as well, um, where I get into some of those, those details. But uh, on that website, you'll probably see that book on there, Beyond Rice and Beans, Seven Secrets to Free Up Cash Today. You know, mm -hmm. those seven things are kind of the same thing that help most of those people free that money up, including myself. Because as I mentioned, I went from millionaire to upside down millionaire. And I had to claw my way back out, right? With no money and no credit. Um, so that's kind of what I started teaching people. I stopped telling people how to get out of the rat race after, you know, 2007, 2008, because I was back in it. And I didn't want to like, you know, be have integrity with what I taught. So I started teaching people what I did know, which was what I was currently doing, which was being resourceful, right? Um, so one of the first things I teach in that book is, is one, start tracking your money. And I don't mean like living on a budget. Like so many people talk about being on a budget. And most people, one, don't even know what a budget is. And two, they don't even have any business creating a budget because they have no clue what they're spending or making, right? So the first thing you gotta be doing is, a, you know, not going that scarcity route of being a spender or scarcity route of being a saver because savers never become financially free either. The Dave Ramseys, 
all those people that become graduates are the ones that come back to me and say, hey, I don't feel any more financially free. Yeah, I don't have debt, but now I'm just at zero. <laughs> I have nothing to show for it. I have assets maybe, but I'm cash poor. There's no income coming in, right? There's like a whole right. big part of that equation missing. And so, so like right there, I was like, hey, let's start as a steward. A steward is actually in abundance because a steward looks at income and expenses both and says, how can I increase income? How can I be more efficient with expenses, but not be living on rice and beans and being dirt poor while I'm trying to become financially prosperous, right? And so yeah. uh, I'll tell you, every entrepreneur I've had that they say, man, like I would love to, you know, I would love to find money, but I don't have any. I'm just too busy to track my money guaranteed they're spending they're 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 losing at least 500 bucks a month you know 500 bucks from various different places right like just just by tracking the money alone becoming aware of what you're doing finds more money you know that's six thousand bucks a year right there yeah ab absolutely um scott Todd, what are your thoughts well i'll tell you what man like um one of the biggest money sucks i know in my family are my kids and i don't mean it like that i'm wasting money like Literally, it's amazing. I never thought that uh, that kids would do this, right? But like, all of a sudden, like when they have their own life, and they're like, "Hey, Dad, can I have uh, can can I can I have uh, you know some some money for some food? I'm going to go out tonight. Uh, don't you need to earn your own money? You know, like mm -hmm. it, it's it's the lessons learned. But man, kids, they cost a lot of money. But you're right. There's so many different ways that we we spend money or we lose money. It's crazy. Yep. I'll tell you, like, and I've got eight kids. So I, I, I feel you there, Scott. <laughs> no. How old are your kids? Uh, they're between four and 16. Jeez. Wow. You haven't even hit the hard part yet. No, I know. Chris, <laughs> man, We're just starting to hit the driving phase barely, right? Yeah, you, there, there's this new thing out there, Chris, called late night television. You and your wife should really explore it. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry. There's no more coming. We're done. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, come so, on. Two more. You got two more in you. <laughs> I mean, you, you got a basketball team and three on the bench. That's incredible. That was the point. Yeah. Well, technically, six, only six are mine. My wife brought two from her previous marriage, so we blended them together like the Brady Bunch, right? But still, it's, yeah, it's crazy. Still, that's <laughs> awesome. So, yeah. you know, it's so, it's so funny, Chris, because I was just yesterday having this conversation with uh, my buddy who flew in from Chicago. Mm -hmm. And he's like a Dave Ramsey guy. And yeah. he's telling me with great pride, he's, he's almost paid off his house. And, you know, him, he's, he's saving tons of money in retirement. Yet, he doesn't want to spend money on anything. Mm -hmm. And he feels super guilty about just really, like, he has a hard time literally living yeah. In, in any sort of joyful capacity because he sees, he's only seeing it as an expense. That's and right. so like he, like he loves going to concerts. He hasn't gone to a concert in a year <laughs> or, you know, I'm, I'm like, they don't eat out or, you know, all these things, but he's, you know, he's putting his money towards, towards that. And I literally don't know what to say to him um, in, in, in sort of a, a nice way. Like, well, what, what do you value? Like, you know, don't you want to spend your money on experiences? Like, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. He's like, but then when it comes to it, I can't do it. Right. It's, it's so true. Like that's, that's where you, you have to go in the middle, right? Cause there's spender on one side, saver on the other extreme stewards right in the middle. Cause the steward says, Hey, I'm actually willing to use money, right? Cause I want to use it in a way that actually increases and multiplies, but I'm also willing to be wise with it too. Right. So you can't take the best of the spender and the saver because at least spenders are willing to use money. Savers on the extreme do not, like you're saying with your friend, right? They're just, they're, they're trapped. And I will tell you that feeling, that emotion of not wanting to spend money doesn't go away when they hit their savings goals. It, if they even hit their savings goals. Because the thing is, even if they hit it, they feel like it's never enough and they have to keep saving. They can never pay off debt fast enough. They can never save enough. It, it ends up becoming the cycle of never enough, right? And right. you cannot become free when you feel like you're in bondage. And it's really a, a, in prison in your own mind because of that extreme saver mentality. You have to be careful of that. Yeah. Scott, do you have any friends like that? Um, you, you know, like I, I can think of some people um, that, that I know that it, it's, it's like they're, they never have money, right? Like they had great paying jobs. 
And all you ever hear from them is, oh, we, we can't afford that, or I can't do that, or, you know, it's like, dude, wh what do you mean? You, you, you make a lot of money. And, you know, they're like, oh, no, I got to save for retirement, or I got to do this. But yet they're letting some of the experiences of life get away from them, you know, mm -hmm. a, a vacation. And, you know, I, I think that, I think that, like, just travel alone, I think, is one of the things that, that ultimately people put off, right? They put off for that other, that later day. Oh, well, well we're going to travel when we retire. Well, for most people, when they retire, their, their health isn't as great as it once was. Mm -hmm. They don't, they don't travel because they're tired. You know, they, it's, it's a lot of work. It's stressful. And then like, they don't travel and then, then they have the regret, right? Like, ah, oh, man, I never got to see that, you know, go, go see it, go do it, go live it now. Mm-hmm. So, so Chris, I can imagine that you have to mediate between the spender spouse and the saver spouse. Yep. How do, how do you do that? They tend to marry each other. That's for sure. Yeah. They, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I have it uh, just yesterday. I was talking to somebody about that same thing where we were talking about, and this is kind of the, I would say this is the second thing you might find that book, second way to find up cash and ways to increase cash flow was dealing with debt, right? Um, they were talking about what, what do we do with our debt? We've got some like an auto loan. Do we pay it off or not? And I have an equation that I, that I created back when I was broke, right? It was a, an equation called the cash flow index. And so what I do is I take the, the balance of a loan, I divide it by the minimum monthly payment, not the payment they're paying, but the minimum monthly payment that's required. And I'll divide that into each other and I'll get a number. I'll get that index. The lower the number, the more I want to pay it off. And so one of the biggest things I tell people is ignore the interest rate, like stop focusing on the interest rate. Like, you know, everybody will tell you to do in, in that world. It's like, it's not important because what I found out was when I was really tight paycheck to paycheck or less than I was actually in the hole at one point, 16,000 a month. I didn't care about what the interest rate was. I only cared about what do I have to pay out of pocket, right? Like what's it costing me every single month because that's what I need to get back. I had to get back to paycheck to paycheck first before I would thrive, right? And so that's the same thing I told them. I was like, you know, based on this, your index is great. You know, and I'll give you an example, like real, um, like practical, right? Say that you have a $10,000 car loan and the payment is $500 a month. And, but the interest is only 4%, right? So $500 a month at 10,000 buck car loan. Then a $10,000 credit card, that's charging you $200 a month. Now say that's at 13%. So it's a higher interest rate. So $200 a month credit card at 10,000 or $500 a month car loan at 4%, right? Now, naturally, what is Dave Ramsey going to tell you to pay off if all you have is 10 grand? Credit card debt. 30%. Credit card debt, hands down, right? But real life has taught us that that's not wise. Because here's the thing. You, yeah, you pay off the credit card. Cool, you freed up $200 a month but you're still making that $500 a month payment on your car. But if you say, hey, wait a minute, if I pay off that car with the same money, that's $500 a month. Now I've created options. I've created this buffer, right? And that 500, I could always apply back the credit card and pay it 700 bucks a month to pay that credit card off quickly anyways. Or I could do something else with that money, right? And you get choices. And, and so many people get caught up. And they, in fact, in my experience, people almost always pick the opposite of what they should do which is actually the most financially savvy thing to do in their situation because of the emotions or because of all these myths have been taught out there. Right. But when it comes down to it, it's like, no, like you can still, in fact, you'll probably end up paying off your debt faster when you have that extra buffer. But if something happens with your income, especially if you're an entrepreneur or investor, if you know, income drops one month or expenses go up unexpectedly one month, you know, yes, you got to have some reserves, but you also got to understand that, Hey, I want to make sure that, no matter what, that baseline expense is lower so I can deal with those little waves. And so you want to get rid of that thing that has the biggest bang for your buck, the biggest ROI when you pay it off, right? Interesting. Scott Todd, this is a new way of looking at, at interest and debt. What are, your, what are your thoughts? Okay, so I actually have a question. So, okay, look. Yeah. Okay, so I've gotten rid of like credit cards and car loans. All that stuff is gone. Mm -hmm. I got my house. And I got a student loan. The student loan, you know, not that much money. The, here's the thing. Both the interest rates are pretty dang low. Yeah. And the debate takes place. Like, maybe I'm tired of just writing that check to the student loan company after all these years, right? Like, I'm, it's like, man, I just, I'm sick of this company. I'm sick of this thing. But logic tells you, 
I should never pay that thing off. It's like 3% a year, mm -hmm. right? Logic would tell you, don't ever pay it off. Take the money and invest it. Emotionally, I hate the thing. I want it gone from my life. So mm -hmm. like, what's your advice? Do I go out and I pay off this thing that I'm tired of writing the check to the company? Or do I stay, stay and keep investing the money in things that's going to earn me more money and look at the 3% as a, as a, as a gift? That's a great point. It, it could be either, right? Um, the emotional part, that's the part you first want to address because even if you pay off that loan, there's still something there you've got to address. It, it's just like in our marriages, right? Like there's, there's emotional stuff that pops up and my wife is amazing at pulling out every little trigger possible that makes me think like I'm a crazy idiot sometimes, you know, like it's like, it's amazing how she can push just the right buttons. And, and I, have, and, and instead of just man, you know, just dealing with it and say, well, that's marriage, right? I have to figure out, well, why does it trigger me so badly? You know, why is it when the, my kids, you know, waste food that I spent time cooking, you know, and they want to throw it in the trash. Why do I get mad at them? You know, like what's behind that belief. That's always the first place to go. Right. Um, so, and sometimes it's in, unmanageable and sometimes you just have to say, you know what, maybe I'm going to pay it off because I can't figure this crap out, you know? Um, but I'll tell you, I actually just paid off my own student loan three years ago. Same reason. It was like, it's at 3%, 3.6%. Why would I want to pay this thing off? And it finally got to the point where it was, uh, that cash flow index, you know, dividing the balance by the payment. It got to the point where it was about, I think it was about a 15 right? So the minimum monthly payment was like 150 bucks, uh, but it was like a 3000 bucks left on it. So it's like 150 bucks a month for 3000. Okay. Yes, sure. I know you guys with land could probably get a similar return or pretty darn close. Right. But I was like, okay, I'm just going to get rid of this thing now. Like it's been 16 years I've been paying on this thing. It's now time to get rid of it. But I enjoyed every minute trying to leverage not paying it off, you know? Um, and so that's the thing is like you do have to find, figure out the balance, figure out the emotions first. If that's something like where logic is conflicting the emotions, figure out what's behind that. Right. Um, but you know, Hey, there's still a time that I got to a point. I said, yeah, it's now it's time to pay off. And I'll tell you any time that the index goes below 20 and it's a low interest, like a mortgage could be a student loan, car loan, anything that's an installment loan where it's a fixed payment, um, low interest. That's usually, if it gets below a 20, that's about the time I might consider paying it off anyways. You know, um, now I'll okay. tell you mortgage though. I may never pay off <laughs> depending on the situation. Okay. So the formula again, take the amount that I owe, divide by my yep. monthly payment. That tells me the index. Yep. So like that car loan example I gave earlier, $10,000 car loan divided by $500 a month. That's an index of a 20, right? Um, the credit card was $10,000 balance as well. It was $200 a month. That index is a 50. So I want to pay off the lowest one first. And then you could do the whole snowball method if you want toward the other ones. And again, if it's an installment loan, like, you know, credit cards, car loans, mortgages, where the payment doesn't go down as you pay it off, right? Like, like lines of credit do. If they don't go down, I build up the savings in another account. And then I take that lump sum, pay it off with one check. So then, boom, I can save the monthly payment right away. So again, it's all about the cash flow, right? What does it do to free up cash and put me in a better place? See, Mark, I think that's a, that's a good point, right? Especially for the entrepreneur. Okay, because, mm -hmm. you know, the entrepreneur is really tied for the most part to uh, a lot of some external factors like the, the economy. That's a big thing, right? Uh, it could be seasonality. And, you know, if, you're, if your goal, like for me, the one thing that I've wanted to do while the time is good is I wanted to make sure that, like, I'm protecting the house. Okay, like times are good. Let's. Let's get to the no debt situation. Let's clear out the debt. Let's be, let's be, let's have some cash because when the, when the weather changes, well, you're going to have to ride it out. Right. You know, and it, we don't know what it could be. The hurricane could be bad. The storm could be bad. It could just be a tropical storm. It could be just like a, a rain shower. Who knows what it's going to be. It's going to change though at some point in time. So man, that would be the time that I would want to leverage the debt. I think, or my ability to leverage debt, credit cards or whatever I could leverage that, but I can't do it if I'm, if when the times are great, I'm living like at the max of a credit card. Like, and that's, I, I like what you're saying about the index thing. Like, don't worry about necessarily paying it off. Worry about, you know, you know, uh, ho holding some or, or going back and investing it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, Chris, I'm looking at my, my mortgage, uh, index. It's like 186. Uh-huh. 
That's good. And I don't want to pay this thing off mm-hmm. because unlike Scott, I don't, I can't eat equity. That's so right. I might as well, you know, the, if the, it's not hurting me cash flow wise to pay off my, to pay down the mortgage every month. And then just the fact that um, I can't eat equity. And then, and then plus I get the tax write off on mm-hmm. the interest and being in the highest tax bracket, that's a, huge. Mm-hmm. So I disagree, Scott Todd. No, 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 no. What are you paying your mortgage off for? I'm not saying I'm paying off my mortgage. I'm saying that like a student loan, for example. Right. Okay. A student loan, Mark, like, you know, you know, like I'm tired of paying the check. I'm tired of paying the man every, every month. I, I know. I get it. it. I get it. That's so an emotional. It's like it wears on you, right? Like, it's like, I hate this thing. And then uh, you look at the balance. You're like, dude, I could literally, it's almost like Chris was saying, I could literally just write a check for this thing and, and put it to rest. Okay. So, you know, all of a sudden I'm like, well, I could write the check or what I could do is I could just put uh, an elevated payment plan to it. For example, like what I'm doing with my student loans is um, that, I mean, the, the index and I'm talking about the index, it wasn't really close to the 20, but I'm like, I'm just going to pay, I want to pay it. I start off to 2020 saying, I'm going to pay this thing off in 2020. So I just took the balance, divide by 12. And that's what I pay, right? Like I'm saying, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do it because I'm sick of it, but I could run a check today if I wanted to. Yeah. Does that make sense? Uh-huh. The mortgage, I have, a, I would have a hard time doing that because like you're saying like, okay, I got to go get the more, I'm going to pay off the house. And then what I'm sitting on, I'm just sitting on all my money in this big thing that what am I going to do? Go get another mortgage. You know, like, why not take that and go do it? And so that's really where the emotional piece comes in, right? I'm sure at some point in time, Mark, you'll be tired of paying that, that mortgage payment. Never. Like, I'll never be tired. Be. Oh, come on. Never. Because I'm, I'm taking that money. I'm doing, I'm doing other things with it. Okay. So, Chris, before we get to your tip of the week, I got to ask you, what do you think is cool or, um, you know, that's, that's, you know, wise or normal that mm-hmm. other people would look at you and they think, Oh, Chris, you're crazy. <laughs> well, let's look at the other half of the equation of using debt, right? When do you use loans and things like that? Um, because I get a lot of those people are Dave Ramsey graduates, right? They're like the poster children. And then they say, I've got no cash. What do I do? And a lot of times we might look at the house, you know, it's like, do we use home equity? Now here's the thing. And this kind of goes in between both of your answers, right? Between you and Scott is, is it's all about stewardship, right? It's about what you could be doing with that money. And again, who are you? Like, how does it really affect you? Because like, for example, I had one guy, um, he's inheriting 200 grand and he's like, okay, I, I make about 40,000 a year as an entrepreneur. I want to replace that income. You know, what do I do? He's like, you want to take the 200 grand and buy some real estate properties, right? Well, I looked at this situation, the whole picture for him. And I was like, well, look at this. We actually should pay, actually pay off some of these loans because- some of those indexes, give you an example, 53,000 of them, if I paid 53,000 of those off, would free up a guaranteed 1,775 bucks a month on the minimum payment side. That's almost 1,800 bucks a month from 53 grand. Now the properties he was looking at, he's hoping for like a 1% a month, 12% a year, right? I was like, well, look right. at this from that standpoint is, you know, we, yeah, we pay this off, you know, 50,000 bucks might make you 500 bucks a month passive, but this frees up 1,775 bucks. This gets you halfway to your goal quickly. You know, then we have still 150 grand we can invest and use however we want. And, and that's the thing is like, it depends on who you are. Now, if you were the uncontrollable spender, I would say pay off all your debt and then put that money as far away from you as possible, right? Because you don't know how to manage and control it. You're not a wise steward, but a wise steward, you can never give them enough money, right? You can never bless them with enough money and enough resources because they'll know what to do with it. And so that's the key is what can you do with that money? If you knew that, Hey, I could pay off this loan and free up a couple hundred bucks a month, but I could also do a a deal with this land deal and I can make 500 bucks a month with the same money. Why would I free up a couple hundred bucks a month when I can make 500, you know, now maybe you might say still, I can make more with it or whatever, but you might get a point and say, man, I can't do enough. I, I can't do any more land deals. I'm maxed out. Here's extra cash. Let's pay off this loan. Right? So there's that balance between them. And so a lot of times I get people, it's let's find all the resource available. And I was like, Hey, look, we got equity in your house. If we know what to do with it, let's use it to generate some real cash flow here because 
as long as it beats the monthly payment, and I think it should at least double the monthly payment. And most HELOCs, for example, if you get a HELOC for $100,000, you're probably gonna pay about 500 bucks a month. My goal, make at least 1,000 bucks a month of that money. If not, maybe we should question whether or not we use it. Yeah, I, I, I love this. And, and Scott, based on what he just said, you and I should have as much debt as possible because we're making 300 to 1,000 percent on our assets. We're right. making cash flow. Right. We almost okay. shouldn't spend money on anything else except for raw land. <laughs> Correct. That's right. No, yeah, I'm kicking myself right now for spending some money. Hey, uh, okay, Mark, like I'm going to go on a limb right now. Okay, like here, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give us like a big rating boost, ratings boost right now. Here's what we're going to title this podcast. We're going to call this Dave Ramsey is wrong. We're going to put that on YouTube. We're going to put it on uh, our podcast. All the Dave Ramsey people are going to come and they're going to hate on us, which is going to be great. Um, what do you think? I love, I love it. I oh, love yeah, it. That's my tip of the week. We got a title. Um, yeah, no, I love it. Um, I think it'll be great. And as long as we have Chris managing the, the YouTube channel and the comments. <laughs> right. Yeah. Hey, then, clarify. Then I think Dave Ramsey has some good stuff, but he can only get you to so far, right? Wealth, not from what he teaches, you know? Um, I've seen yeah. where he works for people, but in the context we're talking about, if we want real financial freedom, there's going to be, a, you're going to hit a ceiling and you're going to get frustrated. And, and that's why, because his, his, his stuff only works to a point of, it's usually meant for people making 40,000 bucks a year, right? It's yeah. people that are barely making ends meet and they need every dollar possible. They got to track every single dollar. Um, I still believe you should track money, but there's a whole nother level to go to. You got to get to that next level to hit that next level of freedom. No, I, I, I 100% agree. And I'm, I'm going to have my cheapskate buddy call you, set up an appointment, <laughs> change his life. So um, we're at that point now, Chris, where we're going to ask you for your tip of the week, website, resource, a book, something else actionable for the art of passive income listeners to go improve their businesses, improve their lives. Chris Miles, what do you got? Well, I'll tell you, check out the podcast, you know, the Chris Miles Money Show, because I get I give so much there. And there's a lot, lots of free resources, stuff that I talk about, controversial topics, including Dave Ramsey stuff, right? But, uh, and, and even you're on there twice. I've, I've had you on. You've been one of my most popular guests on that show. Um, but I'll tell you, if there's a good book to start, to change that mindset, I, I'm going to go away from Rich Dad, Poor Dad, because that's a given. If you haven't read that one, do it, of course. Um, of course. But if you're going to go another level, I would say, you know, look, you know, look for the book, Killing Sacred Cows by Garrett oh. Gunderson. Um, it's actually an old partner of mine that actually got me out of retirement the first time. And uh, Killing Sacred Cows is a great book to kind of hit these financial myths, some of which we've been talking about here today. And so great book to check out. Killing, here it is on, on Amazon. Yep. Now, the way I like to read, Chris, is I like to, oh, it does have an audio. I like to get the book mm -hmm. and then the audio, and then I listen to it on 2x speed and read at the same time. Yeah. And, um, and that way I'm totally immersed in it. And I, you know, I don't have, uh, you know, my mind doesn't wander while I read it. Uh, all right. That's awesome. Scott Todd, you're, you're in trouble, man. That was a really good tip of the week. What do you got? Yeah, that, that's a little difficult to, uh, to kind of balance against, but here, Mark, let me try this one. Check out the website, data-pad.app, data-pad.app. Okay. And data-pad.app. Okay. Yeah. So what's cool about this what I think is cool about this is that like, I know that when I was in my corporate gig, like I needed to know my numbers right away and I still need to know numbers, right? Like I still, I can't leave it to my memory, but like you, you go through and you start to, to like remember some important numbers, whether it's conversions or whatever, you're having a conversation with someone, you better get it right. So this app, it allows you to store in numbers, right? Like you can use it as a calculator, you can calculate things, but then you can save the result and type in what it is, like conversions, for example. So you can say, hey, this, here's our conversion number. So then someone's like, well, yeah, what's that conversion number again? You don't have to look like an idiot and like go, I don't, I think it was this and you're wrong. You pull out this thing, it's right there, all your numbers in one spot. You know your numbers without a doubt. It's all right there for you. You can filter, you can search, you can do whatever. You look like the genius that you are, all with this fun app. I love it. Data, wait. Data-pad.app. Data I see that. 
Uh, and the cool. app store is called Datapad. Know your numbers. Yeah. For some reason, like whenever I put it in my app store, it's, it's telling me I got to sign in my Apple ID. An unexpected mm -hmm. error code while signing in. That's Man, true. I'm going to get a Surface. That's a Mac. There you go. Get a Surface. You know what? Tris, Surface Mac. What, what, Sorry, what, what guy are you? Are you a Surface guy or a Mac guy? Uh, I technically have both. Um, but, uh, I'm moving more towards PC recently, but you know, I don't know. Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm good with whatever gives me the easiest functionality either way. Okay. That was a very politically correct answer. It kind of was for once. Yeah. Very, very good. All right. Well, my tip of the week is, um, start really seeing, um, just where you can improve every aspect of your, of your money and your wealth mm -hmm. and learn more at moneyripples.com. Uh, certainly check out the radio show and the podcast, but just start there at moneyripples.com. And, you know, just, just right away, you'd be like, how to get paid faster. Five proven ways to become a millionaire. Simple ideas to making more money in less time. Become a good steward of your money. Um, and look, after you become a good steward of your money, do us a favor. The only way Chris Miles is going to come back for a third time is if you do three things. You got to subscribe. You got to rate. You got to review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of the review to support at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send you for free the $97 Passive Income Launch Kit course, as well as the latest wholetailing course, How to Double Your Money, 30 Days or Less. Today's podcast is sponsored by Flight School. Just learn more. Go to landgeek.com forward slash training. See how 16 weeks in flight school can literally transform your life where you make so much passive income that you have to hire Chris Miles to help you figure out where else you want to deploy it and leverage it. So Chris Miles, are we good? We're great, man. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming back on. Scott Todd, are we good? We're good, Mark. All right. One, two, three. Let Let. Freedom, Freedom ring. ring. Thanks, everybody. Not bad.